Hi, I am Reverend Dee Dee Jones. And I'm Stan Copeland, the pastor of Lover's Lane United Methodist Church in Dallas, Texas. And we're very excited today because we have with us Adam Hamilton. Adam is the pastor of our largest United Methodist Church, Church of the Resurrection, uh, in the Kansas City area. They've got several locations. You can't just say one place anymore when you're talking about Adam. But Adam, we really appreciate you being with us today. Well, Stan and Didi, it's great to be with you, too. I'm very grateful for you, and it's an honor to be on your program. So thank you. Well, thank you very much. Yeah. Um, yeah, We know that most folks know Adam Hamilton, and most folk Mm -hmm. know Church of the Resurrection, but uh, you started Church of the Resurrection, what, 34 years ago? Is that right? Yeah, that's right. June of 1990 was when we began. I was 25 years old. Yeah. I graduated from Perkins School of Theology in 1988, and uh, I was an associate pastor for two years, and then... My dream when I was in seminary, I remember my senior year in seminary, probably middler year, uh, I began dreaming about, you know, what what is it in my heart I really would love to do? And I desperately wanted to revitalize any United Methodist Church that I was assigned to. I wanted to reach thinking people who, for whatever reason, had turned away from faith. And I wanted to start a church that was going to mobilize and inspire its people to go live out their faith in the world so that the world would look more like the kingdom of God. And I thought I can either, I, when the bishop asked me, what do you want to do? Or actually, it's my superintendent, not the bishop. The superintendent said, you know, what do you, what do you dream of doing? I said, or, you know, what kind of appointment would you like me to think about for you? And I said, I really have two thoughts. One is, send me to a dying church that, that feels like it has no hope, but it's surrounded by people who live around it. Let me yeah. take that and try to turn it around. Or let me try to start a church out in the area where I went to high school for thinking people who, for whatever reason, have turned away from faith. Let me, uh, either of those two, I'd really love to go do. Mm. And instead they sent me as an associate pastor for at a church uh, that was a wonderful church, now part of Resurrection, uh, for two years. And it was during that time that I kept dreaming about starting a new church. And uh, they finally sent us out in 1990 and paid my associate pastor's salary of 25000 a year and gave us, I think it was $10,000 in startup costs. Wow. And said, here, here you go, uh, good luck. And, uh, and they said, but we do think uh, within five years, you could, you could be, I think they said, no, it's 10 years. Within 10 years, we think you could be a church with 500 people a Sunday in worship in 10 years. And uh, which would have made it one of the largest Methodist churches in Kansas City, yeah, you know, at the time. Have. And uh, I'm like, okay, we'll, uh, we'll give it a try. And within three years, we had 500 and within, gosh, but within 10 years, we had, you know, 4,000 a Sunday in worship or whatever. And it just kept growing from there. So it's been exciting. Yeah, it really has been. Yeah, I went to seminary, of course, in Kansas City, as you know. You went to seminary here in Dallas. Um, yeah. But, uh, you know, Adam, from that humble beginning in a funeral home, I might add, right? Right. Church right. of the That's Resurrection right. meeting in a funeral home. And yeah. and now, um, you know, what uh, what's the size of your uh, congregation today? We have, in terms of members, adults and children, I think it's about 22,000. Last Sunday, or the last numbers I have were from two weeks ago, I think we had about 32,000 in worship on that weekend. But that worship attendance is, we had 6,000, I think, in person. At Now we have six locations. Uh, the largest group, 4,400, were at the Leewood location, but we have 6, 000, 6, a little over 6,000 in worship in person. We had, I think it was 15,000 on our local TV, and we had... Uh, I think it was another 10,000 that were online, or no, 7,000 that were online. It was just over 30,000, I think, that we had. And what we found since COVID, so uh, we're gradually, you know, clawing our way back to what we were before COVID Mm -hmm. in person. Yeah. And I think we're, you know, that Sunday we were getting close. We we would typically run on a Sunday in person before COVID around Mm 8,000 in person. And uh, and online we'd have about 3,000. Yeah. Now we have about eight or nine, well, 7,700 to 9,000 online. And then we added local TV, and that was a whole new deal. And yeah. half of our members will worship on TV sometime during the month, uh, mm-hmm. any, given, any given month. Well, so that's your, about where we're at. Your reach is just amazing, and, and it's so inspiring, I think, to all of us who uh, lift the cross in the flame as United mm-hmm. Methodist and um, and, you know, not that denominations are the main thing, but uh, within our denomination and the traditions that we hold, uh, you, you know, we, we believe in those. And we believe in the, the promotion of, of uh, our Lord and Savior through uh, the theology that, uh, that we call Wesleyan. And, uh, Adam, I, I just know your heart burst is for bringing people into relationship with, with Jesus Christ and, 
and um, and in baptism and all the things that are just so basic and traditional related to the church and I know there are others that might have criticized you for, uh, you know, not being uh, uh, what I'd call classical Wesleyan. Uh, what what have you learned through um, the last few years? I know have been pretty tense in our denomination. Yeah, yeah. So uh, first of all, I always find it interesting the the critiques, and I, you know, you and I have talked about this because we both get you know get slammed on on things. But uh, when it comes to theology, I'm. I once described myself as a four and a half star fundamentalist. That sounds terrible, and it's it's really not true. But uh, but in terms of if you think about the fundamentals of the faith, uh, so we talk about the divinity of Christ, the Trinity, the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives, uh, our need for salvation, which comes by God's grace, not something that we do on our own. Uh, you know, all of those things. Those are all things that are that matter to me. Yeah. You know, and and capturing in the creeds. You know, whether it's the Apostles' Creed or the Nicene Creed or the Chalcedonian Creed. You know, all of those all of those things are essential to my faith. And when I look over, you know, the when I look at Wesley, I mean, I feel like anything that we've done that made a difference here, I just tell people we didn't come up with it. It pretty much came out of Wesley's playbook. And uh, I came to faith as a 14 year old atheist who came to faith in a Pentecostal church, an Assembly of God church. Mm. And uh, but when I get to college, I went to Oral Roberts University at college to go to college to study to be an Assembly of God pastor. But I had a lot of questions, a lot of theological questions, and there were places in the Bible where I couldn't just go, okay, wait, I think we, I think it's okay to ask questions. And mm-hmm. I kept being told, don't ask so many questions. And I'm like, yeah. okay. Uh, and, and it was then in the, in the midst of a crisis of faith related to, you know, suffering and two of my good friends who were killed um, that I began looking, thinking I, I either am going to turn my back on this faith or I'm going to find a way of mm-hmm. somebody who's expressed it in a way that makes sense to my intellect mm-hmm. and uh, and speaks to my heart. And that's where I began reading about John Wesley. I went to the library at Oral Roberts, checked out the Book of Discipline, began reading it, and I found the description of the Wesleyan revival in the 18th century, our historic theological stance, the fact that we also believed in uh, social principles, mm-hmm. the ideas of integrating the head, the heart, and the hands, of somehow bringing together both liberal and conserving impulses and pu- pulling them together. Yeah. All that just like spoke my language. Like, wow, this is what I've been feeling, but now I'm, I'm reading about this. Like, like Wesley really did this, you know? And, and yet I went to Methodist churches and they didn't seem alive and vital like Wesley, you know, what I was reading in the book of discipline. I'm like, yeah. I, wonder if, I wonder if they could be alive again. I wonder if mm. they could be revitalized. So that was my heart and passion. And, and, uh, and I've told people, you know, my theology hasn't changed. What has changed is how I've read scripture when it comes to gay and lesbian people and whether mm-hmm. uh, whether there is room. I don't even tell people everybody's got to see it the way I see it. It's just like, I think when we read the scripture, we've got to recognize there's complexity in the scripture. And I, I learned at a Methodist theological seminary how to interpret scripture, mm-hmm. how we have to ask the right questions about scripture. We don't just say, God said it, I believe it, that settles it. That that, that actually dishonors the Bible. It doesn't honor the Bible. Yeah. Uh, you know, and for me, I mean, I carry, this is in my back pocket every day. I carry the New Testament, every, in Psalms and Proverbs. I read it every day. I memorize scripture. I try to, I teach it. I preach it. I study it. And most of all, I try to live it. So when people say, well, you're not a classic, you know, Wesleyan, I'm like, so to be a classic Wesleyan means you got to tell gay people that they are second class and they can't really fit in the church. Is that, is that what it takes to be a classic Wesleyan? Because if it does, you're right, I'm not. But if, but if it's about believing in, you know, the historic essentials of the faith and the Wesleyan revival and the ideas of Wesleyanism and, and our theological statement in the Book of Discipline, which I affirm 100%, uh, then I think I'm a pretty classic Wesleyan. Yeah. And so anyway, but I do have, I do love this United Methodist Church. I, I don't know that I'd die for the United Methodist Church. I would hope I would die for Christ. But I believe in this church and I believe in it even more now. So we're living in this time. My sermon series after Easter is, is going to be called Reconstructing Faith. So we're living at a time of deconstruction where a whole lot of conservative evangelicals and fundamentalists are questioning their faith mm-hmm. and they're wrestling with, you know, the, the, uh, some of the assumptions they made about faith. And for some of them, they're just jettis- jettisoning their faith altogether. But I felt like I went through that when I was in, at yeah. Perkins, mm-hmm. yeah. you know, actually starting at ORU and then, mm-hmm. and then finally ended up at Perkins and going through that sort of deconstructing, which was a part of the model of theological education then was let's, let's make sure you've deconstructed everything and then let's put it back together again. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and so I, I am still a Christian because I found the United Methodist Church. 
And the ability not to read the Bible from a fundamentalist slant, that it's inerrant and infallible and, and you've got to somehow force science and everything else to fit into the Bible, but to understand what the Bible is, how it was written, and how God speaks through it, that liberated, that was liberating for me. It's like, oh my gosh, I can ask questions. The thought that that there is this denomination, and I know some of your listeners are not United Methodists, so this would be true of a whole lot of other denominations as well, but you know, the fact that John Wesley was a in essence, a professor at Oxford University when Methodism started among Oxford students. Mm-hmm. Like there's this, there's this evangelical revival that starts at the center of the highest education, the best quality education you could get at the time. I mean, like that to me is like, I love that. I want to be a part of a church that integrates the head and the heart that's, that's about, you know, being, I, I just tell you here in Kansas City, we received an award uh, last year from a Baptist university that was, uh, they used to be Southern Baptist and they, they're no longer Southern Baptist, but they're historically Baptist. And they presented this award to Church of the Resurrection. Uh, it's the Critical Thinkers Award. And mm-hmm. they said, what we love about you is you invite people to be critical thinkers mm-hmm. and you preach in a way that, is, uh, that, is, uh, that appeals to critical thinkers and that it's okay to have doubts and to wrestle. And at the same time, you have a deep, passionate faith and you're calling people to, to follow Christ, and, but you're giving them intellectual substance to go along with that. And I think, again, that's just Methodist. Yeah. That's just, that's why we started over a hundred universities and colleges across America. It's why we, why we had an educated clergy, you know, and, and, and so, and, and then the last piece of that, so I think about the head, the heart, and the hands, you know, we as Methodists are, mm-hmm. you know, we, we long for people to engage their intellect in their faith. God gave us a brain for a reason. Let's mm-hmm. use it. But then God also invited us and, and, and in Wesleyanism, we, we have the strangely warmed heart. And then finally, we're called to live out that faith with our hands and seeking justice and compassion and mercy and helping the world look more like the kingdom of God. So anyway, I'm sorry I went on and on with that no. answer. But like these are things that I love about being United Methodist. Yeah. <clears throat> and it's exactly the kind of church that the people who have been deconstructing their faith yeah. can find hope in. I hear this every Sunday from people who are like, you brought me back to faith. You, yeah. you know, you're, this church helped me find hope again in Christ when I had given up or I'd turned away. Two or three people said that to me just last Sunday. Yeah, you know, it's it's strange that the word evangelical has been so <laughs> beaten up, really. I mean, it, it tends to mean more uh, politically than anything else these days. But, you know, evangelical in the way that our uh, traditions use it in the church is— has to do with basically the good news, sharing the good news, right. bringing people into a relationship, a uh, saving relationship with Jesus Christ. And, uh, you know, to me, what you've described in the way that um, that that you go about ministry, to me, is is true evangelicalism. It's Sorry. it's it's reaching people that probably a lot of them have given up on the church or probably don't think the church has anything for them. And yep. the descriptions that you've just given t- make me think about how inviting that would be to so many people, uh, yes. secular people. As you know, what is it that y'all say in your uh, in your statement that y'all have had for oh, yeah. Yeah, really our, our from the purpose beginning? Statement, which is yeah, you know, our purpose statement is to build a Christian community uh-huh. where non-religious and nominally religious yeah. people are becoming <clears throat> deeply committed Christians. Yeah, and that drives everything that we do: our budgeting, yeah. our programs, our ministries, my preaching is all aimed at doing that. Yeah, and it's been there for as long as I can remember. That's been the heart and soul of, of Church right. of the Resurrection. And yeah. and, uh, and that was Wesley, right? I mean, he's oh, going yeah. out preaching to Absolutely. the miners. He's going yeah. out preaching in the fields. His, you know, he was looking for the people yeah. who were, you know, who had turned away from church. That basically yeah. a kind of similar period of time, you know, theologically and, and when it, sociologically in the early 18th century where people had been turned off by church. And they mm-hmm. found, you know, nothing, it didn't feel vital or alive to them. Mm-hmm. And he had a faith that both spoke to the intellect and the heart and then called them to go live out their faith with their hands. Let's go start schools for little children who don't have schools. Let's go make sure that there's food for people who are in need. Let's start clinics where we can provide pharmaceuticals for people who need medicines. And, yeah. You know, it was all combined. It was, it was, you know, it was both the church of, uh, you know, of the new birth and finding Christ. And, right. and it was the church of let's go out and see where does the world not look like the kingdom Mm-hmm. And let's work to make it look like the kingdom of God. Yeah. You know, Dee and I have been uh, with other staff members to Church of the Resurrection. Nearly every year we go to uh, the Leadership Institute. And um, and I know Dee has been impressed. We come back and, and uh, we'll talk to the rest of the staff about what we learned. Dee what do you want to ask Adam or what 
uh, what have you learned from your connection to Church of the Resurrection or admire? Well, well um, I'm thankful that you always share your wisdom yeah. of what you've learned. Um, because I think now more than ever, Wesley theology is needed. It's it, it, it always seems to be new for churches, but yet it's not. Mm-hmm. And I love that because I too came from this evangelical background with a whole lot of questions that never made sense to me. And I love that yep. when I go to core, I get those valuable, deep questions answered. Mm-hmm. Um, I think though, what I always wonder is where do you feel like Adam, God has spoken to you personally? Where is, where is hope found you personally where you are in this journey? I mean, as a leader and as a shepherd, that's one thing, uh, but you're also a grandpa now in the process of this. You've, you've, you've been married for so many years. You're a dad, you know, you're all of these things. Where is hope found you, Adam Hamilton in the midst of all of this? Yeah. All right. Well, first of all, I do think, so my experience is I feel God speaks to me all the time, or if I'm paying attention, I think the Holy Spirit is guiding us, speaking to us all the time. It happens. And of course, as pastors, we all, we're always thinking in terms of sermons, you know, so, so I'll, I'll have some kind of insight or feel like God spoke to me and, and, uh, and I'll go, okay, I just save that for a sermon somewhere along the way. But I'll just give you an example. This is a small little thing, but, um, I was with, so we took, our granddaughter is 10. Levon and I have been married 42 years. We got married the week after high school graduation. Mm-hmm. I was 17, she was 18 when we got married because Jesus was coming back at any moment, they told us in the Pentecostal <laughs> church. And we needed to hurry on and you know, hurry yeah. up and get started. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And which was really stupid, but we're more in love today than we've ever been. And I'll tell you, when I think about hope, um, so my granddaughter, we took her for a 10, her 10th birthday. We took her for a vacation out of Branson, Silver Dollar City and all this. I hadn't been to Branson since my kids were 10. And, uh, and had just the best time, but one little story that happened while we were there, Stella and I rode the roller coaster. She's a little, she's a, you know, she was a little scared about getting on the roller coaster. I said, Papa's going to be right here with you. And so we're on the roller coaster and it's, and it was scary, you know, and I'm, I'm a little scared too. And I got a hold of her hand really, you know, really hard, but then we get to the high hill that you climb, you know, and that's pulling you up this hill. And all of a sudden there are tears in her eyes and uh-huh. she's terrified. She is literally terrified. I'm feeling horrible. Like what a bad grandpa. I brought her on this roller coaster. I know she's going to be fine, but I wrapped my arm around her. You know, I've been holding onto the bar, you know, as tight as I could. I wrapped my arm around her, held her really tight. I said, still look at me, breathe. It's going to be okay. We're going to be okay. I promise you we're going to be okay. Papa's right here with you. I got a hold of you. I'm going to keep holding it. Yeah, please hold me, Papa. <laughs> so I got her hand in one hand, my arm around her. And, uh, and we're climbing up the top and it's just terrifying. It's just more and more terrifying the closer we get. And then we, you know, we go down the roller coaster. And, and then it goes right into this, you know, into the end of the ride. And, and I said, well, what'd you think? I said, do you want to do it again? You know, <laughs> and, and I said, uh, I said, what was the scariest part? It was going up the hill. And mm-hmm. I said, so what the downhill was not nearly as scary as you thought it was going to be. It was the anticipation of that fear. And I think, so it hit me just, you know, like that's a life lesson I learned from, you know, I, I already know, but my granddaughter was illustrating is, uh, but it was like, it was this God moment, I felt like, you know, A, I was trying to be, I thought, I've, I'm trying to do for her what I think God tries to do for us. Mm. Hey, it's okay. I got a hold of you. It's going to be all right. Don't be afraid. And to hold us tight. And we're always more terrified of all the things that are coming mm. than they mm. really are as terrifying as, you know, as, as we think. They aren't as terrifying as we think they're going to be. But that's an example of just, I feel like every day when I pay attention, I see a reason for hope. When I pay attention, I feel like God shows up and God is speaking or guiding and mm-hmm. reading scripture and a whole host of other places. And so, I, and I do feel hopeful about the church too. I, mm-hmm. you know, I, I know we're going to talk about that in a, I think in a subsequent conversation, but I, uh, I think we are prisoners of hope. I think mm-hmm. it was Zechariah who says that about yeah. the, right. the exiles. We are prisoners of hope right. and we're coming up. I don't know when you're going to show this podcast, but we, you know, we're, we're before Easter right now. Yeah. And, uh, and our whole focus at Easter is hope. Yeah. It's the triumph of hope, right? And and so, and we not only believe it, we count on the fact that in Christ's resurrection, in his death and his resurrection, he triumphs over evil, hate, sin, and death. Darkness is defeated, right? Death is obliterated because of the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so I, I have to be a prisoner of hope when mm. I believe that. 
Adam, thank you so much. Yeah. We do want to talk to you some more. This is the Hope Connection, and uh, we've got more to talk to you about. So if you'd come back again, then uh, we want to uh, to continue this interview. I'd we love want to, to thank do that. you for tuning in and uh, letting us know uh, uh, about what you're enjoying related to Hope Connection. And uh, we do thank you, and, and uh, we'll see you later.